of Hillel Studies, a series of seminars, lectures, classes, and interest groups which are designed to provide an opportunity for students and faculty to pursue a program of activities that will serve to increase their knowledge and appreciation of the values of Jewish tradition. The chairman for this evening is a member of the Hillel Student Council, Everett Gendler. The next voice you will hear will be that of Everett, chair of the Autumn Quarter. Is Jerusalem and Athens, and the three lectures will deal with the area of agreement the basic disagreement, and the area of conflict. Now, I understand that the lectures are not divided exactly along these lines, so perhaps you'll pardon the exactness of my stating the titles to you. Professor Strauss, as you know, is a professor of political philosophy and has written books dealing with the philosophies and thought of various people, including such varied personalities as Hobbes, Plato, and Maimonides. I'm very happy to present at this time Professor Leo Strauss. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say two things first. The subject is sufficiently clear, I hope, Jerusalem and Athens. As for the subdivision, they were almost correctly stated by the gentleman who introduced me. The area of agreement the area of the basic disagreement, and the third is the actual conflict, by which I mean the actual struggle going on between these two forces. I shall follow this division all right, but it will not coincide with the division into three evenings. I shall have to say very little about the area of agreement and much more about the two other topics. The second initial remark refers to another statement of the chairman, namely that he hopes that some will remember my speech of last year. I hope no one does, because I have to repeat a certain part of that item. <laughs> uh, now, uh, the last point which uh, brings me already to my subject is, in order to avoid a possible misunderstanding, I, I want to say that I speak here as a social scientist. And now, uh, but I have to add, I deviate a little bit from the usual approach of most social scientists. Because most social scientists, when discussing this subject, would speak of two cultures, the Hebrew and the Greek culture. And they assume that there are two cultures out of a large variety, say 17, none of which is more or less important than the other. And culture is a very comprehensive thing including pottery, folk dances, and other uh, things. And furthermore, as a social scientist, is of course neutral or detached. They are just two objects among many. The social scientist would try to understand these two cultures and of course not to evaluate them. For evaluation means a subjective judgment of faith, and which is not permissible for a self-respecting scientist. The difficulty is this, that this scientific objectivity requires much more than abstention from explicit value judgments, which is very easy to achieve. Namely, there are what we may call hidden or invisible evaluations, which are implied in the conceptual frameworks which we use. For instance, when we speak of cultures, we imply that culture is important, and this is a value judgment. Now, the framework used by the social scientist stems from his own culture, which means, for practical purposes, from 20th century Western culture. He studies other cultures in the light of this scheme, and that means he distorts these other cultures. Let me go one step further. Objective social science belongs itself to one particular culture, to a modern Western civilization. We do not find it elsewhere. And the study of other cultures by the objective social scientists of our age might very well appear as a part 
of the spiritual imperialism of 20th century Western civilization. Now, some people who are aware of this difficulty say subjectivity is inevitable, and it is hopeless to attempt to understand an absolutely foreign culture. We understand only our own culture and the parent cultures, which of course would be the Hebrew and the Greek culture. Because these parent cultures have gone into the making of ourselves. A fruitful and intelligent study of cultures would therefore limit itself to the understanding of our own culture and its elements. But this will not do because the difficulty returns immediately. For Greek and Hebrew culture, too, will be <coughs> distorted if we use our present-day conceptual framework. We can't avoid then this difficulty. We cannot sacrifice objectivity. And what shall we do? Now, fortunately, social science has one little segment generally despised by the more scientific members of the profession, which, however, is a good help in this situation, and that is simple history. Because a simple historian, of course, does not want, wants nothing but to understand cultures or people as they understood themselves, and there is no fundamental problem involved in that. It requires a certain amount of assiduity and so, but there is no intrinsic impossibility. If it makes the necessary trouble, takes the necessary troubles, we can understand uh, cultures of which we have a sufficient number of written documents. And this is fortunately the case as far as these cult cultures are concerned. So that is the way in which I want to approach the problem, a historical way. If we make then this little step of transforming ourselves out of cultural anthropologists into old-fashioned historians, the first thing is, which we have to do is to stop talking of culture, or even of cultures or even of culture. I may remind some of you who are, have, are more viciously inclined of that Nazi who used to, I forgot his name, to, who is the poet who have said that I get nausea when I hear the word culture. Uh, he thought that culture is incompatible with the kind of cannibalism he liked. But he was, of course, utterly mistaken. He was not informed. He did not know that there are cannibal cultures as well as non cannibals <laughs> Now, the Nazis' reasoning was poor, uh, but I agree with his conclusion. <laughs> we shall not use the term culture, which, of course, is a term of German origin and is therefore not altogether irrelevant in this context. Culture, uh, culture is not... Uh, in the first place, uh, to come now to a somewhat more serious argument, there is no biblical equivalent for the term culture. The Hebrew word is not biblical in this sense. Now, the, the Greeks do have a term which could be considered the origin, that's the term paideia, more literally translated education, and perhaps a little bit more literally the doings of children or concern with the bringing up of children. Now, this term can be used in a fuller sense, as it was used by the Greek philosophers, and that it means those activities of man which contribute to the perfection of man as man, the perfection of man's nature. But here is already a difficulty, because if culture is a perfection of man qua man, it means that by becoming cultured, the Greek, for example, ceases to be a Greek, because it's not the perfection of Greeks in particular. It's a pure accident that the Greeks, according to this view, discovered what it means the perfection of man. Certainly, culture in this sense, in the sense of the Greek idea, does not allow of a plural. There cannot be cultures. There can only be one culture. And until a fairly short time ago, I think about 100 years ago, the term was always used in the singular, of course. There are now 17 different perfections of the one nature of man, the perfection of man. We could also say completion. And when we see, think of completion, we have the equivalent, the Hebrew equivalent, you know, shalom. 
which literally translated means peace, but in the sense of completion. So there cannot be 17 different pieces. It's only one full piece of you, not man. Peace, unless you misunderstand my translation, P-E-A-C-E. Now, how then must we conceive of Jerusalem and Athens, if not in terms of cultures? We need a much more simple term. Jerusalem and Athens designate ways of life, or ways. Now, other than ways, in the sense in which there is a Cheyenne way, for instance. The Cheyenne way, if I'm correctly informed, is a way for the Cheyenne the right way for the Cheyenne people. But Jerusalem and Athens claim to be the way, the right way, for all men, for man as man, with a minor qualification in the case of Jerusalem. And that's to say, Jerusalem and Athens make a direct demand on us, which the Cheyenne way does not do. We cannot merely contemplate them we must choose or reject them. We cannot understand them objectively if we do not take them seriously in what they mean. Detachment, in the sense in which most social scientists understand it, is really here impossible if we want to be good social scientists. Furthermore, each of these two ways claims to be the right way. That means that they exclude each other. We are confronted then immediately by an antagonism. We are forced to choose among the two. The exposition which I am going to give is based on the premise that the antagonism between Jerusalem and Athens is our most urgent concern. And this is a subject which I want to discuss. I think it is the most appropriate, especially for Jewish students, because Jews, they are referred back to Jerusalem, and students of philosophy or science, they are referred back immediately to Athens. This antagonism is a displeasing thing. We like harmony, especially in our age, if you remember that since, at least since the time of the Second World War and its preparation, to say nothing of the Cold War, where Western civilization is threatened as never before, what prevails is a concern with the dignity of Western civilization, and somehow unity is more dignified than antagonism. And therefore we hear many speeches and read many books praising the unity of Western civilization. For we do not have to worry about the real problems if we can be sure that all is well in our civilization. That seems to be the thought. But I'm afraid this unity of Western civilization is spurious. Nor would I say this is a bad thing that we do not have a unity in our civilization. The West, it seems to me, owes its glory and its dignity to the antagonist of its constituent elements. It owes to this antagonism its vitality. That basic antagonism prevents, as long as it is effective, spiritual dormancy. One could make this objection. Is it not true that the whole intellectual history of the West is a proof of the possibility of a harmonization or a synthesis between these two opposed elements. I do not think so. The whole history of the West shows us one attempt after another to achieve a synthesis. But all these syntheses, as far as they could claim to be so, have broken down. The harmony is impossible because each of the two constituents Jerusalem as well as Athens, preach each one thing as the one thing needful. And the one thing needful preached or praised by Jerusalem is the opposite. 
of the one thing needful preached or praised by Athens. To use one word, Athens says insight, understanding, philosophy is the one thing needful. And Jerusalem says obedient love. You can reconcile the two things, but only by subordinating one to the other. Athens can, as it were, use obedient love as a means. And Jerusalem can use philosophy as a handmaid. But neither obedient love nor philosophy is meant to be a handmaid, but is meant to be the queen. Now, every disagreement presupposes some agreement, because people disagree about something. If the disagreement is fundamental, they agree regarding the importance of that something regarding which they disagree. We have to turn first to the area of agreement between Jerusalem and Athens. I will try to describe it by a few examples. To describe that agreement between Jerusalem and Athens provisionally, I have to return to the subject, they agree in regard to modern civilization or to modern culture. If we turn immediately from the modern world to Jerusalem and Athens, we are struck by the identity of their judgment on the modern world. With one voice, they condemn the modern world, the modern invention, modern man's attempt to erect by his own efforts alone the city of man which would be free from want, war, and worry. The tacit or explicit assumption of modern man, as far as he is merely modern man, is the view that there is nothing higher than man and his culture, or that our salvation depends on our faith in man. The Bible tells us that only the man who puts his trust in God is blessed, and that the man who puts his faith in man is cursed. And Greek philosophy tells us that the human things, which include almost everything we call culture, are trifling as compared with, a, with what they call the divine things, or that man is something inferior, despicable almost, that not man but God is a measure of all things. The backbone of the modern concept of culture is a view that art is equal to the highest things, if not superior to anything else. The Bible forbids the making of any likeness and asserts that art is the invention of the progeny of the first murderer. And Greek philosophy tells us that what we call art is thrice remote from the truth, that art is merely an imitation of nature, the poets tell many lies, and that poetry, to say nothing of the inarticulate arts, must be subject to moral and political supervision over against the individualism of modern man, that's to say his belief that human excellence consists in the free development or the self-realization of his absolutely unique individuality. The Bible and the Greeks teach us, Greek philosophy teach us with one voice that not the free development of the individual, but is conforming to an absolute pattern, which is the same for all, can make a man a real human being. The value of the individual depends not on his individuality, but on his conforming to the divine law, the will of God, or the superhuman order. Over against the modern view that the biggest things are the best, or the worship of success, the Bible tells us that God is not in the great and strong wind, nor in the earthquake, nor in the fire, but in a still small voice. And Greek philosophy tells us that what is best in man is very small in bulk. 
over against the delusion that what is one's own is the best, or what is of one's own people is the best, or that we have to accept the values of our civilization without murmuring. The Bible protests by saying that God has called the Egyptians, these pagan oppressors, my people. And Greek philosophy protests by pointing out the absurdity of dividing the human race into Greeks and barbarians. From the modern view, which is so favorable to all kinds of distractions, that there are many ultimate goals of equal value, we are called back by both Bible and Greek philosophy, who again say with one voice that there is and can be only one thing needful, and that only awareness of it can free man from his enslavement to wealth, pleasure, security, reputation, and the pursuit of these things. We may put it differently and say that Jerusalem and Athens agree and not only if they are confronted with the modern world, but beyond that. That thing regarding which they agree may be called, loosely, but intelligibly, I hope, morality. They agree, if you permit this term, as to the importance of morality, and as to the content of morality, and as to its ultimate insufficiency. They differ as regards that X which supplements or completes morality, or which gives morality its basis. I will first speak of the agreement in somewhat more detailed form. According to a widespread misconception, which you find, for example, in German literature in Heine, I think these writings of Heine have been translated, and in English literature, I believe, especially in Matthew Arnold, there is a fundamental opposition between biblical morality and philosophic morality. If you hear certain people, you would believe that the Greek philosophers did nothing but preach pederasty, whereas Moses did nothing but curse pederasty. Those people must have limited themselves to a most perfunctory reading of a part of Plato's banquet, of the beginning of the Charmides, and of the relevant sections of Deuteronomy. They cannot have read the only work in which Plato sets forth specific prescriptions for human society. The judgment of Plato's laws on pederasty agrees fully with that of the Mosaic Code. Nor can these gentlemen have considered the fact that King David addresses his dead friend Jonathan with the words, Thy love to me was wonderful passing the love of women. Those theologians who identified the second table of the Decalogue, or what they call so, with a natural right or law of Greek philosophy, were well advised. It is so obvious to Aristotle, as it is to Moses, that murder, theft, adultery, and so on, are unqualifiedly bad. Greek philosophy and the Bible agree as to this, that the proper framework of morality is a patriarchal family, which is or tends to be monogamous, and which forms the cell of a society in which the free adult males, and especially the old ones, predominate. The Bible and philosophy say a lot about the nobility of certain women. But in principle, they both insist on the superiority of the male sex. Just as the Bible traces Adam's fall to Eve immediately, Plato traces the fall of the best social order to the covetousness of the woman. Consisting of free men, the society praised by the Bible and Greek philosophy refuses to worship any human beings. You worship, says a Greek philosopher to his comrade in arms, you worship no human being as your Lord, but only the gods. And that same man expresses an almost biblical abhorrence of human beings 
who claim divine honors for themselves. Bible and Greek philosophy agree in assigning the highest place among the virtues, not to courage, but to justice. And by justice, both understand primarily obedience to the law. The law that requires man's full obedience is in both cases not merely civil and constitutional penal law, but moral and religious law as well. That law is the guidance, the Torah, for the whole life of man. In the words of the Bible, it is your life, or it is a tree of life for those who cling to it. And in the words of Plato, the law affects the blessedness of those who obey it. The comprehensiveness of the law has been expressed most perfectly by Aristotle, who says, what the law does not command, it forbids. I hope you understand the bearing of this grave statement. Substantially, this is a biblical view as well. Obedience to a law of this kind is more than ordinary obedience. It is humility. No wonder, then, that the greatest prophet of the Bible, as well as the most law-abiding among the Greeks, the Spartans, are praised for their humility. Law and justice, thus understood, are divine law and divine justice. The rule of law is fundamentally the rule of God, theocracy, and retribution. What Plato says in the Tenth Book of His Laws, and others say elsewhere, about man's inability to escape from divine retribution is almost literally identical with certain verses of Amos and the 139th Psalm. In this connection, it is proper to mention that the kinship between the monotheism of the Bible and the monotheism toward which Greek philosophy is tending and the kinship between the first chapter of Genesis and Plato's Timaeus. But Bible and Greek philosophy agree not merely regarding the place which they assign to justice and the connection between justice and law, the character of law and divine retribution. They also agree regarding the problem of justice, the difficulty created by the misery of the just and the prosperity of the wicked. One cannot read Plato's description in the second book of the Republic of the perfectly just man who suffers what would be the just fate of the most unjust man, without being reminded of Josiah's description of him who had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, and was oppressed and afflicted and brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And just as Plato's Republic ends with restoring all kinds of prosperity to the stricken just, the book of Job ends with a restoration to the just Job of everything he had tempered, or almost everything he had temporarily lost. In my exposition, my previous exposition, I have tacitly replaced morality by justice, by which I understood forced by the text. Obedience to the law, as the Greeks say, to the nomos, understood as a divine law. This is the common ground, the area of agreement between Jerusalem and Athens. It would be more explicit the problem of divine law. The Bible and philosophy can start from the same basic notion of the divine law and of the problem involved in that. The Bible and philosophy solve that problem in diametrically opposed ways. Before I turn to this antagonism and try to make it intelligible, I would like first to illustrate that antagonism by enumerating some of its consequences. I have spoken of the place of justice in both Bible and Greek philosophy. Now we may take Aristotle's ethics as the most perfect presentation of philosophic ethics. 
Aristotle's ethics has two focal points, not one. One is justice. The other is magnanimity or noble pride. Both justice and magnanimity comprise all other virtues, but in different ways. Justice comprises all other virtues insofar as the actions flowing from them relate to other human beings. I have to be courageous, temperate, and so on and so on, in order to be just in the full sense. Magnanimity general run of man is concerned, virtue presupposes a substantial economic equipment. One cannot have moral virtue without having property, as in the Middle Ages the philosophers still maintained and they were condemned by the Catholic Church for that reason, among others. The Bible, on the other hand, uses the terms poor and pious or just as synonymous terms. Compared with the Bible, Greek philosophy is heartless as this, in this as well as in other respects. Magnanimity presupposes a man's conviction of his own worth. It presupposes that man is capable of being virtuous, thanks to his own efforts. If this condition is fulfilled, consciousness of one's shortcomings or failings or sins is something which is below the good man. As Aristotle says, sense of shame, which is such consciousness of failings, befits young men who cannot yet be fully virtuous, but not men of mature age, who are free not to do the wrong thing in the first place. Or to quote the remark made by a 20th century gentleman about another, Disgrace was impossible because of his character and behavior, unquote. It is controversial between Socrates and Aristotle whether man can become fully virtuous. But if Socrates denies that man can become fully virtuous, he merely replaces the self-satisfaction, the self-admiration of the virtuous man by the self-satisfaction, the self-admiration of him who steadily progresses in virtue. I did not coin the term self-admiration, it's used by them. He does not imply, as far as a heavy few are concerned, uh, that they should be contrite, repent, or indulge a sense of guilt. Now, man's guilt was indeed the guiding theme of tragedy. Hence, I would venture to say, Plato rejects tragedy from his best city. Tragedy is replaced by songs praising the virtuous. And according to Aristotle, the tragic hero is necessarily an average person, not a man of the highest order. The tragedy is composed and performed for the benefit not of philosophers, but of the multitude. Its function is to arouse the passions of fear and pity and to purge these passions. Now, fear and pity are precisely the passions which are necessarily connected in the feeling of guilt. When I become guilty, when I become aware of my being guilty, I have at once the feeling of pity toward him who I have hurt or ruined, and the feeling of fear of him who avenges my crime. Just think of a case of murder. Humanly speaking, the union of fear and pity in the phenomenon of guilt, might seem to be the human root of religion. God, the king or the judge, is the object of fear, and God, the father of all men, makes all men brothers, and thus hallows pity. Now, according to Aristotle, it are these feelings which have to be purged by tragedy, and the result is a liberation of the better type of man from all morbidity so that they can turn wholeheartedly to noble actions and not consume themselves in a self. Of that ruthless examination of one's intentions, which is a consequence of the biblical demand for purity of the heart. Know thyself means from the philosophic point of view, know what it means to be a human being.
Know what is the place of man in the universe. Examine your opinions and prejudices rather than search your heart. This philosophic lack of depth, as it can be called, as Aristotle says, the intentions are immanifest. So the only thing which really counts are the actions. This philosophic lack of depth, as it might be called, can consistently be maintained only if God is not is assumed not to be concerned with man's goodness, or if man's goodness is assumed to be entirely his own affair and to be his own peril. As Plato says in the banquet, the, or indicates there, the only relation between man and God is that through arrows, desire, love. But arrows the offspring of wealth and poverty belongs only to imperfect beings. The relation between man and God is a one-way street from this point of view. And therefore the doctrine of reward and punishment in its literal meaning would, cannot be more than merely a popular story. Bible and philosophy agree indeed as regards the importance of morality or justice and as to the insufficiency of morality. But they, but they disagree as to what completes morality. Understanding or insight or contemplation which completes morality according to the philosophers tends to weaken the majesty of the moral demands, whereas humility, the sense of guilt, repentance and faith in divine mercy which completes morality according to the Bible, necessarily strengthens the majesty of the moral demands. A sign of this is the fact that contemplation is essentially transsocial, as social, whereas faith is essentially related to the community of the faithful. As Thomas Aquinas put it, Wisdom, in the philosophic sense, is purely theoretic, whereas wisdom, in the theological sense, is both theoretical and practical. Or, as Yehuda Levi indicates, the wisdom of the Greeks has most beautiful blossoms, but no fruits. That as social perfection, which is contemplation, normally presupposes a political community, what the Greeks call the city, which is considered by the philosophers, therefore, as fundamentally good. And the same is true of the arts, without whose services political life and philosophic life are not possible. According to the Bible, however, the first founder of a city was the first murderer. And the descendants of that man were the first inventors of the art. Not the city, not civilization, but the desert is a place in which the biblical God reveals himself particularly. Not the farmer Cain, but the shepherd Abel finds favor in the eyes of the biblical God. The force of the moral demands is weakened in Greek philosophy because in Greek philosophy those demands are not backed up by divine promise. According to the philosophers, evil will never cease on earth, whereas according to the Bible, the end of the days will bring perfect redemption. Accordingly, the philosopher lives in a state above fear and trembling as well as about hope. And the beginning of his wisdom is not, as according to the Bible, the fear of God, but wonder. Whereas a believer in the Bible lives in the fear, in fear and trembling as well as in hope. The particular serenity of the philosopher may be illustrated by the following comparison, for which I am partly indebted to Sir Thomas More, who says, and I quote, and for to prove that this life is no laughing time, but rather the time of weeping, 
we find that Jesus himself wept twice or thrice, but never find we that he laughed so much as once. I will not swear that he never did, but at the least wise he left us no ensemble of it. But on the other side, he left us ensemble of weeping. Unquote. Now, if we turn to Socrates, the greatest personification of philosophy, we find that he left us no ensemble of weeping, but he left us just one ensemble of his laughing. And I think that here you have the difference in a nutshell. This difference between the philosophic and the biblical attitude has been expressed in the words of Paul about the New Testament Gospel. It is an offense to the Jews and a folly to the Greeks. That's again in a nutshell. Another illustration of the influence on the force of the moral demands by the opposite attitudes encouraged by the Bible, I would like to mention a few more examples. I spoke of sense of shame, which, as Aristotle uses it, corresponds exactly to what is called in the biblical tradition, feeling of guilt, of repentance, and of sin, and so on. That is not a virtue in classical philosophy anymore. Not even piety is a virtue problem. If you look at the Platonic and Aristotelian lists, it doesn't occur. That was still very well understood in the Middle Ages. When Maimonides discusses this fundamental problem, he says, he makes a distinction between wisdom, in the sense of moral wisdom, and piety. Moral wisdom is taught by the philosophers, but piety not. From the point of view of the philosophers, practical moral wisdom consists in finding the means, whereas piety always consists in an excess, going beyond the means. The most telling example, perhaps, is the following one. The most you know the story of the binding of Isaac in Genesis. It's the story of the Akedah. God gave a command to Abraham, which was really absurd and was meant to be absurd, because it contradicted the promise which God had given originally to Abraham, that he will be blessed in his posterity, and then he was commanded to sacrifice his own son, his sole son. The command was absurd, and yet Abraham obeyed wholeheartedly, without question. He did not reason. There is a remarkable parallel to that in Greek literature, the ambiguous command which the Delphian god gave to Socrates by saying that Socrates is the wisest man in he knows of, and Socrates did not obey wholeheartedly. He found it was absurd, and he questioned the God. He examined that statement, and that was the beginning, as he tells us at least, of his philosophy. Now, I would like to mention also this, that there is at least, uh, if you take the great problem of tragedy and comedy, there is, of course, no tragedy and comedy in the Bible. But there is something which is in between to sow with tears and to harvest with joy. You know this scene when Hector takes leave of Andromache and the little boy as Tiernax creates and makes certain things in the British in a striking contrast to the silly gravity of the situation and then the mother laughs while crying. Dacrio en Gelasaza. I don't know how you can say it. And that is, this mixture is biblical joy. Joy among tears. But the most striking point, of course, is that there is nothing in the Bible, whatever, which can be brought into comparison with the comedy, which is one of the major premises of Greek philosophy. Now, statements of this kind, statements of this kind which could be multiplied indefinitely, are of course of a very limited value as proofs. Because if you take out each single item you might find, and you would find probably, 
parallels in the other culture, and we cannot uh, therefore have to go to a less ambiguous dimension. What then is the unambiguous and unmistakable, undeniable difference between Jerusalem and Athens? Now this problem was discussed with the greatest force in the Middle Ages, actually. Be not before, because only in the Middle Ages did a very high developed philosophic reflection meet with the biblical tradition. Not before, because when the Jews and later on the Christians met Greek philosophy, Greek philosophy was in a state of decay. But uh, in the 12th, 11th, 12th century, when, they, when philosophy had recovered its force and its comprehensiveness, uh, then the real discussion started. Now, and there, a real analysis and diagnosis of the difference was made by the most competent man. I mentioned Maimonides amongst the Jews and Thomas Aquinas amongst the Christians. Now, what is the difference? I take Maimonides' analysis because I'm more familiar with it and I, I'm more convinced by it. And now what is the difference? The, the Bible teaches, that's the basic principle of the Bible, creation out of nothing. Whereas philosophy necessarily teaches the eternity of the visible universe, that's Aristotle, or at any rate the eternity of matter. Other classic philosophy. In other words, the characteristic teaching of the Bible is divine omnipotence, because creation out of nothing is simply an other expression for divine omnipotence. The biblical God is not subject to an ananke, a necessity, or to a realm of ideas. He is absolutely the highest being. I cannot and need go into the question what the religious significance of divine omnipotence is, but the fact, I believe, is undeniable that this is the characteristic uh, the, uh, uh, teaching of the Bible. There are statements in Greek authors to the effect from the time of Homer that God or the gods are omnipotent, but the contexts make it clear invariably that they did not mean omnipotence by what they called omnipotence. So uh, it is safe to say that this is the characteristic teaching of the biblical tradition. One could go on from here and start the discussion on this basis, but I do not want to do that for the following reason. Because this diagnosis is somewhat misleading. It creates the impression that opposition between Jerusalem and Athens is that between two opposed philosophies, a philosophy which teaches a divine omnipotence and one which denies divine omnipotence. This diagnosis, in other words, blurs, or is apt to blur the fact that Jerusalem, what Jerusalem stands for, is precisely not philosophy in any sense. How then shall we proceed in understand this difference adequately? I hear that my normal time for this lecture is up, and I have really reached a point I admittedly a somewhat unsatisfactory point at which I postpone the discussion. I would like only to indicate with two sentences how I expect to go on. I would like to go back to that remark I made before, that the area of agreement is the divine law, as a notion not common to the Jews and the Greeks and, and to many people. I would say common potentially to all peoples or cultures. I would like to explain what the problem of the divine law is, and I would like to show how this identically the same problem is solved in, the, in two diametrically opposed ways, by philosophy on the one hand and by the Bible on the other. If I succeed in showing that, then we can raise the question after we have gotten a somewhat clearer picture, perhaps, than we have before, of what the issue is, whether this issue can be decided. But this I have to postpone.
Professor Strauss will be glad to answer questions. Subjects for future lecture series. Would you like to comment on that? I would answer with one. First of all, your question is absolutely unhistorical. To explain what I mean by this term, I would ask you one question. What is the Greek word for religion? Fun? Logos? Over. Logos means rather something like calculation, much more than religion. Yeah, so there is no Greek word for religion. <laughs> because there, there are Greek words for divine things, for piety, for saintliness, but there is no word for religion. So, in other words, there is a, a religio is a Latin word, and if there is a Hebrew word which was introduced, but here any of you, the linguists present can correct me immediately, I think from the Persian, via the Arabic, the word deen, the Arabic deen, the Arabic, Arabic term deen, which has, is derivative from deen, yeah? from deen, divus, dios, etc., took on the meaning of religion, so there is no word for that. The word religion is one of these words which I would condemn in my capacity as a historian and would not use it except when speaking of Latin, the Latin world and the derivatives from Latin. That is at home and it has no commerce. No, but you can say that's very pedantic and nasty and I would like to discuss it in a, in a more conciliatory manner. <laughs> is this Greek, what is called Greek religion? I mean, if we may call, we know of course what we mean by that term, nevertheless. Is this a Greek religion is of no concern to us whatsoever. It's of a merely historical interest. No one believes in Ap or thinks of believing in Apollo or Zeus. And if certain somewhat eccentric persons believe they believe in it, he can really disregard. That's not a serious proposition for our life. But Greek philosophy or philosophy as such, not Greek philosophy, philosophy is, as the University of Chicago partly is committed to that idea. Similarly, what some folk dances and pottery in Israel there, you know, and even the social organization, as Max Weber, for example, tried to, to elaborate it, you know, a certain social, which are without any deeper meaning, that is of no concern to us. But the Bible asserts something which is meant for us today, you see, and not merely for the past age, which we have to take seriously. That I meant that the, the, the attitude of most social scientists or historians, which look with complete detachment, with equal interest or lack of interest, at all phenomena is really not feasible. It is not objective. You know, it, it doesn't fulfill the demands of the subject matter they want to study. So I think there is nothing artificial. On the contrary, I would say this treating unequal things as equals, that is an artificial thing which I'm afraid you implicitly proposed. The natural thing is to treat equal things equally and unequal things unequally. Are there further questions? Mr. Strauss, you said that Connolly was one of the premises on which the works. On which it is based, yes. Oh. <laughs> Well, I, it's a very long question, but I will give you one, one indication. The term philosopher, in the strict sense in which we use it since the time of Plato or Aristotle, is not the original term originally used by the Greeks. The original term is sophos, from which philosophers is derived. And sophos means a wise man. 
Now, wise man has many meanings, of course. It may also mean a smith, a blacksmith, for example. You know, he's wise in his job. But in a more emphatic sense, of course, it means the wise man is a man who is wise in regard to the most important subjects. In this sense, the poets are as much wise men as the philosophers in the narrow sense. So. Now, keeping this in mind, we raise this question. If you look at all tragedies, Greek tragedies, especially certainly in, in, in Aeschylus and so forth, the wise man, as wise man, this is a poet, poet, is not a subject of the tragedy. The wise man, as poet, is the subject of the comedy. In, you, you can see this from various comedies of Aristophanes. For example, well, first of all, he himself is a person in a way, in the insertions, but Euripides and Aeschylus and so they are persons. So the wise man is a theme of the comedy, whereas he is not a theme of tragedy. That is not merely an accident of artistic technical requirements, but is perfectly intelligible once you understand what the philosophers understood by themselves. To look at Socrates himself. Socrates is not, from the Greek point of view, a tragic figure. Yeah. It's, uh, that is a modern, sentimental interpretation. He, he died, he was executed, but that is in itself not a tragic thing. Tragic is, is sad, but it's not tragic. But said Socrates was a comic figure, is obvious. Quite natural. He would be comical. So as, uh, just as Thales was comical when he, when he looked at the stars and fell into the well. So, in other words, from this point of view, the comedy is nearer to philosophy. There is also an other side to that. But without, one can safely say, without this possibility of looking at things, which comedy developed, philosophy in the full sense would not have been possible. But that is a very long story. Uh, I have not yet. Read the last sentence of Plato's Banquet. There you find a key to many, many things in Plato. Yes. Mr. Strauss, did you say that Eros is the child of wealth and poverty. Is it not? I mean, I may be a mistake, but is it not what... what I don't you understand. Mean? Oh, I... Th oh, I mean nothing about it. Plato made it. So good. Is this... That is a myth told in the banquet. That wealth and poverty married and, and they generated arrows. Now, what does that mean? It means that wealth in the full sense, perfection. Yeah. Perfection and complete emptiness, merit, and that is Eros. In other words, a perfect being would not have Eros, of course, would not have desire. Yeah. Now, that is, of course, granted by biblical theology as well, but the point is that whereas in biblical, th in, in biblical language we find two kinds of love, as it was later developed by the theologians, the love of desire and the love of abundance which is not based on desire. There is no, what, what in the New Testament is called, as I said in Greek, agape. That doesn't exist in philosophy. I mean, in later on in Neoplatonism, is, is an analogy of course, but not in classical Greek philosophy in the strict sense of the term. The, uh, uh, the famous statement of Aristotle that God moves the universe as the beloved. All things aspire toward him. There is no movement from the Aristotelian God downward. You see? It's only a way of uh, movement upward. And that, uh, I think, is really essential to, to, to classical philosophy. However, this may be obscured by certain later developments in philosophy. I wanted to ask you a question. Please. The Greek tragedy is selection of relevant literature in the Yeah, there is. Yeah, perfectly right. It was wholly uh, arbitrary. I admit it. I don't want to make you cut the ground under my question. No, no, but go uh, on. But uh, what I wanted to inquire was this. Even if one grants that the, the most significant, the salient portions of the Bible were available at a comparable period of the fourth century, which one can speak of the most significant of the Greek philosophy, yes. the question could still be asked. 
ask whether certain of the distinctions and comparisons 